Hey, would you do me a favor? Grab your phone or smart device and open up that camera. Then point it right here at the QR code. Do you have it? I'll wait a second. When you see the link pop up on your screen, give it a tap. You ready? Boom! Welcome to the Hillsborough County official YouTube channel. We've got all sorts of videos here, all about what makes our community such an awesome place. From local events and community highlights to what's in the perfect Cuban sandwich. We've got it all. We're always adding new things, so while you're here, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you'll never miss a new video. Here's that QR code again, just in case you missed it. Go ahead and check it out. Ooh. This must have fallen out of that video. This really is the perfect Cuban sandwich. Good morning and welcome to the April 20th Hillsborough Environmental Protection Commission meeting. I will call this meeting to order and invite Commissioner Cepeda for the Pledge of Allegiance and Invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. 
We ask you for your wisdom over the Board of County Commissioners. We ask you for your wisdom over the EPC. We ask you to lead, lead us, lead every one of us here, Lord. And we ask you to, we thank you for the land that we here in Hillsborough County. And we ask you to continue to protect this land and our environment here in Hillsborough County. And we thank you for your protection over all of our military men and women that are serving and those in law enforcement and our first responders. We thank you for that in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Just for the board to know, it sounds like our tablets are broke, so we'll be doing voice votes for the time being and until told otherwise. Right, Rabbi? All right. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I would ask, do we have any changes to the agenda at this time? No, Commissioner, we do not. Any removal of consent items? No, Commissioner. All right. It does look like we have one in-person speaker today. Are they here? They are here? Okay. Um, each speaker is allowed three minutes unless the commission directs differently. If you wish to provide public comment, um, please see the guidance below on our website at agendas and public comment. And I will invite, it looks like, Mr. Coleman up to speak. Thank you. Hello. My name is Dave Coleman. And um, I... Um, I started paying attention to what was happening in the environment in my community um, several years ago um, through um, involvement with Extinction Rebellion, which is kind of an alarmist group who was um, doing direct action to try and um, <clears throat> stave off some of the problems from climate, <clears throat> climate change and ecocide um, worldwide, really, um, but particularly here in um, Hillsborough County. Um, because of my involvement there, I got involved with um, the Hillsborough County Democratic Environmental Caucus. I uh, caucused also with Sierra Club. And during that time, um, I became aware of um, this, this, this report, and I hope that you all have seen it and really dug through it. Um, it's from 2001. It's in a uh, <clears throat> consent order, um, case 1275. And it's tons of pages about how egregious Tico was um, 20 years ago. Um, after that, um, they did come up with a closure plan, and they closed one of the 10 unlined um, coal ash piles. I found that out. Um, and um, re more recently, I found an article um, from a person, <clears throat> a criminologist, actually. I thought they were an environmentalist, but they were a criminologist. And in 2015, they did their thesis over in USF. And I hope that you all have taken a look at that, at least, at least perused it a little bit. Um, there are scathing reports on TICO and um, what they have done in our community um, <clears throat> going back even 30 years. And then um, <clears throat> kind of brings me up to today. Um, kind of why I'm here is that um, I don't know that our, our county is addressing things. The mayor came up with this 50-point plan. It's a resilient Tampa plan. And um, the 50 points have really absolutely nothing to do. If I take Ian and what happened down at Fort Myers, and I look at what would happen to here in Hillsborough County, and I look at this plan, it does absolutely nothing to avert that. And then I'm, I'm looking and trying to find in the county where there is any kind of plan that we have at all. What are we going to do with the thousands of people that are in East Tampa, and particularly Progress Village, which is sitting underneath co mosaic gypsum stacks and those unlined coal ash piles um, that will just be inundated and flooding all through that area. The pictures of horror we see over, over in Lake Worth from <clears throat> mosaic gypsum stacks. I cannot comprehend the damage that's going to happen to the community should we have an Ian come here. And it's getting more and more likely that we are going to have something like that. Um, <clears throat> I kind of went all through my talk and I had this thing to read from. Um, I do want to say that um, Joe Citro two years ago, um, I'm done. Thank I'll come you, back Mr. Coleman. Next month. Okay, we will move to the approval of consent agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion by Commissioner Cohen and a second by Commissioner Myers. It sounds like the majority of us are still going to vote on the tablet, and then the two without will vote 
um, by voice, so. Yes. Yes. Motion carried, seven to zero. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Um, at this time, we'll move into the regular agenda item A, seeing that we have no public hearings still, correct? Yes, All right, sir. perfect. And that looks like it's going to be an overview of environmental programs and services. Yes, Commissioner, this was a request from Commissioner Myers. Uh, it was to show the value of the agency, um, and it's a great thing for the public to see. We have three new sitting commissioners, and um, we have a lot it's, uh, in our what we do operationally, so we've broken it out for di from division. We'll have a brief overview, and this month we'll be featuring water, so we have Sam L. Robbie to give this overview. Hi, Sam. Good morning, Commissioner. Sam L. Robbie, EPC staff. And like Janet said, uh, this is an overview of our environmental programs and services agency-wide. I will start by giving a background on the agency itself up front, then I'll dive into the water, no pun intended, the water division. And then subsequently in the following months, you will hear from air, waste, and wetlands divisions. The Environmental Protection Commission of Hillsborough County was created by Special Act back in 1967, and those activities uh, under the Environmental Protection Commission, uh, they include reasonable uh, uh, pollution control uh, of contamination for air, water, and soil, and property, and uh, to control the excessive and unnecessary noise within Hillsborough County. The governing body of uh, the EPC is the County Board of County Commissioners, and they sit as a separate entity in a separate capacity, uh, and the Environmental Protection Commission has jurisdiction that includes all three municipalities, City of Tampa, City of Plant City, and City of Temple Terrace, as well as the unincorporated uh, portion of the county. At EPC, our mission, vision, and values provide the framework to ensure that we remain focused on our goals. We utilize them throughout our daily interactions with our community, and we evaluate them annually as part of our strategic planning process, which we do twice a year. How do we ensure our success? Well, the EPC is a premier organization driven by documented facts and metrics. Our agency has embraced the sterling management process to steer us in the most efficient and effective way. We reevaluate and fine tune nearly every aspect of our processes, ultimately achieving the Florida Governor Sterling Award and uh, thereby uh, governing what we do within that framework. We continue to use this performance-based model for continuous improvements uh, driven by specific goals and objectives. We emphasize transparency and use extensive metrics, process mapping, and key performance measures to gauge our performance and service delivery to our citizens. Here is a list of our uh, core functions. They encompass, uh, first and foremost, citizen support and outreach, air and water quality monitoring throughout the entire county, uh, environmental permitting for air, water, waste, and wetlands, uh, compliance assurance across all these medias, and enforcement when uh, needed. As a local agency, we gained the confidence of state and federal partners and received 15 major delegations to provide one-stop service to our customers. These delegations include air, water, waste, and wetlands program, and some of them go back to the mid-80s. Commissioners, here's a flavor of few agency-wide metrics for last year, 2022. Typically, you may occasionally hear about a high-profile case or an issue uh, from time to time, but the agency engine continuously grind through routine work, work throughout the year, day in and day out. In 2022, EPC issued over 1,800 uh, permits for our customers. We investigated over 1,500 uh, pollution, pollution complaints. 
uh, we conducted over 4,000, nearly 4,200 compliance inspections at facility that may have uh, pollution issues in air, water, waste, and uh, wetlands. We have assisted nearly 1,550 entities, individuals with compliance issues. We hold hands, we explain rules, regulations, we expl explain to them what can be done on their site to maintain compliance with environmental laws without resorting to any uh, further uh, compliance or enforcement. In the petroleum cleanup uh, uh, program, back in, in 2022, we have completed the cleanup of 52 petroleum contaminated sites. And since the inception of this program, so far we have completed 1,722 uh, cleanup of, of petroleum contaminated site. And this program is fully and completely funded by the state uh, DEP. They provide the funds and cover every single uh, aspect of the program, and we do the clean up here in Hillsborough County. In air monitoring, we have uh, conducted over 3,000 sampling events throughout the stations we have in the county. Water monitoring, uh, sampling events, uh, over 2,500 separate sampling events uh, for all uh, county freshwater and saltwater bay segments uh, were conducted in 2022. Our on-site lab had performed uh, 47,000 plus analyses to support air, water, and waste uh, in, in, in our uh, agency. So that just, that just, just gives you a flavor. If you don't hear from this agency for 12 months, if you don't see any single meeting, the routine work that comes in and out is, is extreme. Uh, also, it's help, it helps to talk about funding. Well, we continue. Sorry. Our goal is to be responsible with the fiscal resources that we're given. We maintain fiscal responsibility to stay within our budget, and we maintain that. We continue to bring nearly $1 for every dollar we receive from the county. Uh, this past year, our operational, with money that comes from state and federal government, comes along scrutiny and audits. So this past year, in 2022, we went through 47 total audits that cover our financial uh, situation, our operational divisions, programs, delegations, and on-site certification. We use these audits and their results to improve our program and performance. Now, uh, we'll go specifically into the water division services. The functions under the water division include uh, surface and groundwater protection. That's our focus. We have state DEP delegation for domestic wastewater, sewage mm -hmm. treatment plants, and collection system permitting. We also have industrial wastewater permitting compliance enforcement delegation from the state. That's the only industrial wastewater program delegated by the state to any county in the state. We have our extensive water monitoring program, surface water and benthic mon monitoring. We have the on-site lab services that supports the entire agency, along with habitat restoration and the management of the pollution recovery fund. Here's a snapshot just for the water division specifically for 2020, just last year. We issued 393 permits and authorizations and processed these in-house. We did not deny a single permit that came in. All these applications, some of them are not approvable, but we go along and help applicants to get into a compliance point where the permit is issuable, and we issued all 393 applications last year. We investigated 423 complaints, water pollution-related complaints that come from citizens. We have conducted 722 compliance inspections at facilities that may has the potential to cause water pollution. And we provided 265 compliance assistance to citizens and entities to bring them into compliance uh, with environment, water environmental regulations. And we have uh, conducted over 2,500 water monitoring sample events 
uh, throughout the entire county and processed over 47,000 uh, analyses in, in our lab. With this board's approval uh, back in the 1990s, we pursued and secured delegation from the state DEP for local control. Uh, what did that do and what did, did that mean back then and still means today? It affirmed local control of and oversight of the regulations on behalf of the county and the state. It helped streamline the process and provide one-stop permitting for the regulated community. It eliminated potential duplication between us and the state, and it required no additional staffing for the county, uh, and therefore it required no additional cost. The program was already set, and we were doing the work, and the state had confidence to give us the program and stayed clear of our way. And it proved so far in the last 20 some years that this is good government and it's good business. As a local program, local programs are always uh, provide uh, a service that, 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 that a service that is faster, it's cheaper, and uh, it's more responsive to its local constituents. Here I will attempt to show you some water functions aimed at controlling water pollution from industrial and domestic wastewater operation. As you can see, this is a shot, a uh, couple of pictures from Port of Tampa. And uh, you see the bulk storage on top, and you see tank farms in. Our industrial wastewater program works to improve and protect the quality of surface waters and groundwaters resulting from industrial activities and try to control runoff and provide improved water quality that goes into surface water. Other industrial facility inspection you see here by staff is uh, watching the lining of industrial ponds to contain process water that helps prevent leaching and contamination of groundwater and the containment prevents uh, runoff and, and leaving the site. You see the prill sulfur uh, on the upper right. Also inspectors try to uh, inspect and, and uh, see the containment runoff uh, ponds on site uh, and try to prevent sloughing and migration issues. Concrete batch plans, also the operation of it is messy in the lower bottom portion. Uh, we have an oversight over that. And an in interesting shot of the lower right, it's a, it's a lined uh, containment pond, storage pond on top of the closed gypsum stack at Mosaic's Riverview at the phosphate gypsum. And this lined uh, pond contains processed water to manage the inventory on site. Also, we try to control runoff and leaching. Here are some domestic or sewage treatment plants. This is the Northwest Regional Rec Reclamation Facility. Our domestic wastewater program protects the public health and the environment from potential effects of the collection, treatment, and disposal of wastewater that wastewater is removed from residences, businesses, and institution. Here is more uh, small wastewater facilities. Our inspection program is maintained at these small package plants to ensure compliance with the delegation agreement and compliance with environmental regulations. We investigate lots of complaints. Uh, on an annual basis in the water division, we receive north of 400 water pollution complaints come from citizens, some of them are really egregious, some of them are mundane, some of them are neighborhood feuds. You get pump station, look at the one on the top right, that's a lift station with one of the flanges, one bust, and things are fanning all over the place. Um, you see we, we dyed a, a discharge to Hillsborough River in one of the uh, broken pipes, and you can see the green die in the middle picture on the right, indicating that the flow did make it to the river. Yeah. Also, you see pipes with all kinds of things spewing out of it. Citizen would call, they'll be jogging, walking their dogs, or driving, and they see things and they call. And we rely on the good citizens out there to be on eyes and ears and call in things. And some of them are benign uh, and of no consequence, but when we investigate, we try to verify and make sure that is the case. Here is a manhole in the bottom left overflowing of sewage. This is a you know, typical complaints that we get normally. 
Also, we get complaints on lakes. Um, the example of algae complaints that can be pretty unsightly. Uh, the top one, that's not a bucket of paint uh, that's thrown in, in this area. This is what we got from a citizen when they called. They say, somebody dumped uh, red, pink, uh, orange buckets of paint. You need to come take a look at it. In fact, this is algae, and it's called Bacchiococcus, and it has that uh, reddish, tannish, it depends the time of the day and the sunlight on it, the typically orange uh, tinge to it. It's natural algae, it comes and goes. We investigate it, try to convince the citizens this is not really paint. On the bottom, you'd see floating algae mats. Uh, this is called lingbia, and it, sometimes it turned into whitish in color, and people call it in as uh, clumps of bathroom tissue papers come out and take a look. This is just uh, one type of algae. The summer times, it's seasonal rains, it exacerbates the complaints, typically because we deal with water. Lots of water come in, it's pretty difficult to contain it sometimes, and it supercharged the uh, collection system, and thus we have lots of complaints. Our complaints in the summertime typically go 300 percent uh, for overflows, flooding-related complaints, uh, lakes turning brown, uh, houses flooding, sewage running down the street, uh, and you name it. We do coordinate with municipalities if it's within the city of Tampa, uh, Plant City, Temple Terrace, and we get them involved. We provide information and assistance to the citizen, and we respond to these complaints. And a lot of time, we do sample to make sure that uh, bacteria level are low, or if there is an issue, we'll inform the citizens. Picture is worth a thousand words. This is sanitary sewer manhole overflow on Bay Shore Boulevard as a result of uh, intense rain event uh, was a few years back. Now let's shift from the regulation side of the house into the monitoring side of the house. The left side you see a, a picture uh, for the uh, state of Florida courtesy of NASA, and uh, uh, to the right side is the bay segments, Hillsborough County along with the bay segments, Old Tampa Bay, Hillsborough Bay, Middle Tampa Bay, and Lower Tampa Bay. And the surface area of, of our watershed here is over 1,000 square kilometer. It's, it's a huge. In gray here, you will see the watershed. The watershed that feeds into the bay proper is uh, encompasses areas from Hillsborough County, Pasco County, Pinellas, Manatee, and Upper Sarasota Bay that go, it, it flows uh, to the west, northwest, and empties into Lower Tampa Bay. EPC Monitoring Network is the longest continuously running monitoring program in the nation. You've probably heard that in the past, but we pride ourselves with this, and it is really known worldwide. Uh, we have about 266 surface water stations in Hillsborough County, including Tampa Bay, the rivers, and their tributaries, and Lake Thonoda Sassa. Our data is utilized by broad range of federal, state, and local agencies to identify and carry out reasonable and cost-effective environmental improvement projects uh, and bay management initiatives. Our data is used by us first and foremost in Hillsborough County. We investigate complaints. We gauge areas that are good, bad, or ugly, and, and we try to have some policies and resource management to target those poor areas and leave the good ones alone. So we focus our resources on that. Our data also helps Hillsborough County government maintain compliance with state and federal water regulation. So Hillsborough County, Public Works, uh, utilities use our data to stay in compliance with the state and feds. Uh, other agencies that use our data, EPA, NOAA, DEP, FWC, the water management districts, regionally, Tampa Bay Estuary Program, Regional Planning Council, Tampa Bay Water, counties and municipalities, colleges, universities, worldwide. The information produced by our data, we use it to really identify impaired waters. 
and then we determine the total maximum daily loads for these water segments, how much they can take, and whether the load is excessive. We identify and try to control the pollution sources that come into the waters. And uh, on a state and federal level, they develop uh, basin management action plans, they call them BMAPs, to target and clean up uh, blighted uh, areas. And of course, uh, in our area also, we evaluate restoration efforts. Here is just one chart will will show the story of water monitoring on the bay. This is just the bay segments. You can see on top of that uh, yellow green uh, chart, the bay segment, Hillsborough Bay, Old Tampa Bay, on top across Middle Tampa Bay, Lower Tampa Bay, and bay-wide grades. Those are the grades. If you go back to the early 70s, it used to be uh, orange, bad, failing, not good. And over time, things improved to yellow. It's a C-grade type deal. And then we kept focusing the work regionally with our partners, and now you can see that the bay has improved dramatically. It wasn't like this all the time, but it took a lot of effort, a lot of partnership uh, to get to where we are. In the last few years, Tampa Bay had some serious challenges to contend with, including the Piney Point discharge and the red tide that visit us every year. The yellow designation of Lower Tampa Bay for 2021 reflects these challenges. The good news is last year in 2022, all bay segments were in the green. And that is pretty good news. Here is the same data, but in a graphical form. And this is to show trends over time. Same data. You could see the four bay segments go up and down. They used to score in the mid 40s, way back then in 1974. And now the trend line has been steadily moving up and moving up is good. The trend is improving. And all the way now in 2022, we're in the upper 80s, lower 90s, depending on what bay segment you are in. So the trend is up, the trend is good. Year in, year out, you would see the lines go up and down depending on rains, runoff, hurricanes, storms that pass through, um, water quality issues, nutrients, inputs. But that wobble keeps on wobbling up, and, and but going up. So yes, we have setbacks, and then it moves back up. The trend line tells a very good story. This shows you uh, the monitoring stations in the freshwater side, not in the bay. This is inland. In addition to the salt water sampling on the bay, our monitoring staff doesn't just collect the sampling from boats. We have approximately 130, 129 exact uh, sampling stations throughout the county. We sample from bridges, from uh, roadsides, and here are field crews prepping and sampling uh, fresh water from uh, Hillsborough County location. What's the value of all that? The value of our monitoring work is not only environmental, it is economic as well. The health of the Bay enhances the quality of life and sustains economic growth in our area. It's documented in a report prepared by the Tampa Bay Ashwari Program and Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council that report titled Economic Valuation of Tampa Bay, they found $22 billion in GDP for the Tampa Bay area is due to a clean, healthy bay. One out of every five jobs is dependent on a healthy, clean bay. 1.4 million employees work within the Tampa Bay watershed that we showed uh, a few slides back. A home on a healthy, clean bay would generate an average of four times the amount of taxes than the median uh, county home. Tampa Bay area is one of the most desired for location in recent years uh, here in the state of Florida. In addition to water monitoring, we have also biological monitoring. And our biological staff, they're dedicated scientists with a couple of them have PhDs and expert, expert on the subject. They do uh, sampling and sediment monitoring, and they uh, uh, look for organisms living within the sediments uh, and uh, to assess and gauge the overall health of the benthic uh, environment. Benthic organisms living in the sediments are an excellent indicator of the health of our environment. 
And based on that, we can tell which areas are poor, which area has uh, great biodiversity and healthy. We are also in water involved in habitat restoration. Artificial reefs provide hard bottom substrate to increase biological diversity in the bay and also productivity. Uh, and they enhance recreational fishing opportunity in the bay. We have deployed over 50,000 tons of material across eight reefs since 1986. And they pro proved to be a successful story. Seagrasses. Seagrasses are an important nursery habitat for many marine organisms that live here in the bay. They are also excellent indicator of the quality of water that we have. Seagrasses need sunlight to grow and greater light penetration equates to healthier seagrass beds and healthier bay. Our on-site lab provide support and services for all uh, agency divisions. They uh, provide analyses for our water sampling program, for our air monitoring program, atmospheric deposition, and they analyze samples for other uh, regulatory programs such as waste, wastewater, and field investigation of contaminated areas. It's cheap, it's uh, responsive to us, and it's run uh, within a reasonable budget, much cheaper than privately run labs. We manage the Pollution Recovery Fund uh, in the Water Division on behalf of the agency. EPCPRF fund provides grant money for projects to restore polluted areas, mitigate the effects of pollution, and to otherwise enhance pollution control activities within the county. PRF has provided over $8.5 million of environmental projects in Hillsborough County since 1987. It's a reinvestment program of sorts that comes pretty handy. Recent high profile cases that we were involved with, obviously the Piney Point in the last few years and their discharge of over 200 million gallons of processed water into the lower bay, uh, we're still dealing with that until today. Red tide issues, you'll be hearing red tide presentation from Chris Pratt in a few minutes. And that is an annual event. It's a naturally occurring thing, but we deploy and gear up for it every year to gauge where it's at and what it's doing. Good news, bottom line, I don't want to steal the thunder of Chris. So far, so good for Hillsborough County in this season. Sewage overflows is a constant thing. We have thousands and thousands of private and public lift stations. Every now and then something goes wrong, a pipe break, pump quit working, and we respond to those and, and we do affect uh, uh, restoration and recovery. Also, a few years back, we were involved in responding and deploying staff for extensive water sampling monitoring in eastern Hillsborough County to gauge the impacts of new whales, gypsum stack, sinkhole, which is in Polk County across the county line, and provided uh, all the data information we have to this board and to the citizens in eastern Hillsborough County. In conclusion, commissioners, the water division activities are an integral part of the agency's goals towards pollution control, resource protection, and the quality of life enhancement for our citizens. And all the good work that we do in the water division, uh, it, it would never happen without the great dedication of your water staff in the agency that is so dedicated and so committed to doing the good work. Not just the water division staff, but all the agency staff uh, at large. We work as one unit and we collaborate internally to produce the protection that is mandated to us. With that, I finished my remarks on the water division portion of the presentation. I can take any questions you may have. Any questions? I don't have a a question, but thank you so much for that overview, for updating us. I certainly appreciate it. Yes, uh, real quick, um, first watching some of those people skim, I, I didn't like the techniques. I can help you out with that. But um, on the seagrass issue, because um, I'm on Tampa Estuary and the Hillsborough Interlocal, um, 
there, there's a lot of talk on, on possible solutions. And I guess I'm just curious what EPC is doing. Are we working with those groups? And are there any possible solutions to bring it back? Because it seems pretty devastating what's happening out there uh, as far as the seagrass goes. So I just wondered if you had any kind of update on that. Very good questions, Commissioner. And thank you for your work on the boat. And you skimmed pretty well. We uh, are part and parcel with the whole uh, Tampa Bay and the agencies that deal with seagrasses. It is uh, primarily done with a swift mud. They take the lead on it and they do the uh, survey every two years. And you will be having a seagrass presentation on the latest results coming in, uh, was supposed to be next month, but the person in charge of the program is deployed, he's in the military, he will be out for a couple of months, but we'll bring him back hopefully in July, August for you. Seagrasses is a continuous effort amongst all the uh, uh, lo local programs in here. We reduced seagrass coverage, it was reduced because of pollution down to about 16, 17,000 acres in the area. Then all the good efforts, Ashura program, all local programs, we brought the coverage up to 42,000 uh, acres in, in this area. Now it's going back. Now it's around 32,000. We have lost a few thousand acres in, in this last survey that we conducted. They look at all kinds of things, what possibly could be. Water quality is an issue because if it is not too clear, sunlight doesn't go down, sea grass beds don't grow as good. They're looking at inputs of storm water from various areas because some areas have worse inputs of fresh water that is contaminated, runoff, what have you, than other areas. Um, and like I said, this is a collaborative effort with just one part of it, and we do part of the survey for uh, Swift Mud as, as part of their team. So we don't do all the work, but we do a portion of the work with them. But we'll bring the experts to talk to you once they're back in town from uh, serving in the military. To, to yeah, specifically and, and that'll be interesting because there's theories that just fly around everywhere on how to remedy it, um, almost like hair plugs, pulling the back of your hair out and plugging it at the top of your head. Um, folks say that they could do that with seagrass, and uh, a lot of people disagree. So um, as a new commissioner and, and newly on these boards, I'm just really interested to get some real experts here that say, you know, this is going to work or this could work. So, Correct. Well, yeah. you're talking about scale is over a 1,000 square kilometers. Wow. So yeah. planting by hand is not going to hack it. Yeah. It has to be a natural process. For it to be natural, the inflows coming in got to be close yeah. to natural composition. Yeah. Sunlight has to be in there. So it's affected by currents, it's affected by tides, it's affected by sunlight, weather patterns, and nutrient input to the bay. So there's too many things. I'm not an expert at it, but, mm. but just based on what I read. So we'll get the expert on the subject before you in a couple of three months. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Cohen. Uh, Commissioner Owen, thank you for bringing that up because uh, it, it came up at the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council the other day. The agency for bay management sort of sounded the alarm and said, we've lost a third of our seagrasses in a very short period of time. Is it the case also that it's a worse problem in upper Tampa Bay uh, in that in the part of the bay that's north of the causeway? All Tampa Bay. Yes, it is. Commissioner, that's very good observation. That portion of the bay is not totally landlocked. It is kind of secluded. It doesn't have the circulation the other open parts of the bay have. It doesn't have recirculation as good. So it stays more stagnant. It's shallower. Sunlight hits it more. Things sit in it more. And the fresh water inputs, the runoff that comes into it, the quality may not be as good. So it it really suffers more than any other part. That's a pretty good observation. Because we, we um, you know, when we look for solutions, some of them may be finding ways to circulate the water. I mean, it, the reason the water doesn't circulate is because we built a bridge with very few openings in it that, that prevents the water from, from circulating. Right. Um, I just wanted to make the observation about citizen uh, call-ins and, and people reporting things when they, when they see things happen. Uh, a couple of years ago, when I was on the Tampa City Council, my mother called me on the phone and she said, you know, I don't normally call in about things, but there's water flowing down my street at an alarming rate, and something is seriously wrong. 
And I called the city and, and what do you know, there really was something seriously wrong and there was like a, a huge water main break and, and uh, it, it was a big problem. And where I'm going with this is people should report things in when they see them because in fact, you may not know about it and it might be something that really is serious. If somebody's out there and they see something that looks like the orange paint, and they don't know what it is, and they, they are uncomfortable, what should they do? How should they reach out to you um, and, and make sure that it gets checked out? Well, we're, we're out there. Our website has our numbers, uh, emails, and people call in. People write in, send emails. Uh, we receive calls all the time, and we don't take lightly any of them. Some of them we hear them time in, time out, but we go out almost on, on every single complaint. And we check it out. Some of it is benign. Some of it is egregious worse. Some of it is medium. But we always respond. This is one item that EPC prides itself more than anybody else in the county, probably in the state, is responsiveness to the, to the citizens. And we do it within 24 hours to a maximum. We have an internal policy, Janet instituted, no later than three working days. But 99% of the time is it within 24 hours we investigate all incoming complaints including weekend, holidays, and nights. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner. If I don't, for the members of the public, I'll let them know that our, cell, our phone at EPC is 813-627-2600, and you can call 24-7, and we have people work holidays, nights, and weekends. Everyone's on call. Because let's, let's be realistic. A lot of these things happen on the weekends um, uh, if there's illegal filling or things like that or illegal construction, um, or illegal dumping. Um, so the other thing is if you want to get to the website, it's epchc.org, and we're here to assist. All right, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you, sir. All right, next item. Thank you, Sam. Um, then the next is the legislative update for the 23 legislative session. We just have a few weeks to go. There are a lot of bills across the board. Um, we're just going to highlight a few of the environmental ones. We've talked to you and your, your briefings on them as well. So with, with us, we have Beth Lee. Beth Lee is in our legal department, but I want you to know that she came from the wet, started in the water division, was in the wetlands division, got her law degree, and is now with us up in the legal council, and she's amazing. So Beth? Thank you, Janet. Good morning, commissioners. Um, my name is Beth Lee, an attorney with the EPC Legal Department. Today, I'll be providing you a brief legislative update for this current 2023 legislative session. The legislative session began on March 7th, 2023, and will conclude Friday, um, May 5th, 2023. As you know, the commission has empowered the executive director and commission chair to monitor, lobby, and comment upon bills that may affect EPC authority. The EPC legal department monitors both environmental and administrative bills each session, and this presentation will cover just a handful of the bills tracked by our department, but the agenda item today has provided for today's meeting um, has an overview of many other bills. To start out, we have the mangrove planting and restoration bills. Senate Bill 100 and House Bill 561 would require the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to adopt rules for mangrove replanting and restoration. The rules would address erosion in designated areas of critical state concern, such as Big Cypress or the Green Swamp, protect barrier and spoil islands, and promote public awareness of the value of mangrove statewide and identify vulnerable public and private properties along the coastlines. Further, with the identification of these vulnerable uh, properties along coastlines, the bills encourage partnership with local government entities to create local mangrove protection and restoration zone programs for implementing the rules developed by FDEP. These bills both appear to be a positive attempt to protect and enhance Florida's mangrove shorelines. Senate Bill 100 has been passed by two committees, and House Bill 50, 60, uh, 561 has unfortunately not been heard by any committees. The comparable bills titled Management and Storage of Surface Waters revise exemption language for measures or practices implemented primarily for environmental habitat creation or enhancement activities on lands specifically classified as agricultural or government-owned lands. 
the bill's remove language, which previously limited this exemption to only measures or practices determined to have a minimal or insignificant individual and cumulative adverse impact on the water resources of the state. In addition to removing that limitation, the bills explicitly state that the measures or practices may alter topography of the land, including activities that divert the flow of surface waters or impact wetlands on the land if the activities result in a net increase in wetland resource functions. And the bill is describing wetlands resource functions as the activities must be planned, designed, and implemented to result in a wetland habitat that resembles the characteristics of a functional wetland habitat in the same region. If the measures or practices result in a, water vi uh, a violation of water quality standards, then they do not qualify for the exemption. Further, the bills remove uh, language that requires FDEP or the water management districts to notify in writing whether the proposed activity qualifies for the exemption within 30 days of receipt of the exemption request. The bills also remove language requiring written notice prior to commencement of the activity. EPC has delegation from FDEP for certain wetland activities such uh, as such. The language in these bills could alter how EPC regulates impacts to wetlands and other surface waters on all agricultural or government owned lands. House Bill 371 has not been heard by any committees and Senate Bill 910 has only been passed by one committee. Moving on to House Bill 1197 and Senate Bill 1240 titled Land and Water Management. These comparable bills propose to preempt local governments from adopting laws, regulations, rules, or policies relating to water quality or quantity, pollution control, discharge prevention or removal, or wetlands. This language preempts such regulation regarding these factions solely to the state. Currently, there is no movement for either bill through committees, which is indicative of the bills likely not passing this session, but because the language is a major preemption on local governments, EPC will continue to track the language as the session continues. And lastly, the next set of bills titled Organic Material Products, House Bill 1361 and Senate Bill 1472 are related to nuisance protections provided to classified agricultural properties under the Florida's Right to Farm Act, Chapter 823 Florida Statutes. The comparable bills both define organic material as vegetative matter resulting from landscaping maintenance or land clearing operations. The term also includes clean wood and materials such as tree and shrub trimmings, grass clippings, palm fronds, tree and tree stumps, and associated rocks and soils. This definition is identical to the FDEP's definition of yard trash regulated under section 62709. The purpose of these bills are to include activities related to organic material collection, storage, processing, and distribution to the type of farm operations that are protected under the Right to Farm Act. Where the bills differ is that House Bill 1361 was amended through committees to remove the concerning language that created an automatic determination that if you were just processing the organic material, then your property is automatically deemed agricultural. Senate Bill 1472 still includes this language. However, the Senate bill has only been heard by one committee and the House bill, which in this regard is more favorable, has been passed by all three of its referred committees. If a version of these bills is passed, the EPC may be limited in regulating certain facilities located on classified agricultural property under our Chapter 1-7 waste rule. So commissioners, that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Any questions from the board? No, thank you very much. Good job. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Beth. Um, we'll be bringing up next 9C. This is the Red Tide update. We'll have Chris Pratt give that. It's just very, very brief. Good morning, Commissioners. Hi, Chris. Chris Pratt, EPC staff. This morning, I wanted to give you a brief uh, background and update on the Red Tide conditions in Tampa Bay. So, Florida red tide, red tide in Tampa Bay. This is a naturally occurring phenomenon. Uh, it's caused by a microscopic single-celled organism known as Karenia brevis. It is, again, naturally occurring. It was first observed by Spanish explorers during the 16th century. 
Uh, it was doc scientifically documented in the mid 1800s and is driven by wind, ocean currents, and weather. That's why it comes in and it goes out. Uh, it's found offshore in background, lower concentrations year round, and it's in, found in salt water environments. <clears throat> Uh, red tide is when it gets to such a high concentration of Karenia brevis, that's what causes the red tide that we get to a bloom level. And what the, the issues are is the Karenia brevis has a neurotoxin that are called brevitoxins. And this is what causes the fish kills. So the brevitoxins affect the, the uh, nervous system of the fish. It kind of stuns them. And it also affects sea turtles, birds, marine mammals, all, all sorts of manner of, of uh, animals that live in the, in the ocean, and this is what causes the mass fish kills we see at the, at the beaches when we have these conditions. Um, and then once they die off, you have the odors and uh, high bacteria levels in the water. Um, brevitoxins can also accumulate in shellfish, such as clams and oysters, and cause neurotic shellfish poisoning. So if humans consume the, the shellfish, during the time that there's a red tide going on, it can make them sick. So red tide, the, when there's red tide conditions, the FWC will close down shellfish harvesting. And then the other thing with, rev, with the, the red tide is, is the uh, aerosolation of the cells when, with wave action at the beaches. So people that have respiratory issues, when they maybe asthma, COPD, COPD uh, when they breathe that in, they have problems. And even contact with the water, if you don't have those type of problems, can cause eye and skin irritation. So again, red tide is naturally occurring, but human activities can worsen it. So nutrients that are found in fertilizers, uh, sewage treatment facilities, uh, th those, those nutrients enter the storm water through the summer rains and visual into Tampa Bay, and they act as fuel for the red tide. So, Carnia brevis is out there, background concentrations. It hits these nutrients. It's like pouring gasoline on a fire. It just blows up, and then we have these bloom levels. Uh, so these are some pictures that were published by the Tampa Bay Times off of Pinellas County in the uh, beginning of March. You can see the, the discoloration of the water there uh, on, this, on the surface, that banding, that, that kind of cloudiness. That is the red tide off of Pinellas County. Get another picture. Uh, the farther to the right of this, of this picture, you know, to, uh, to the Gulf of Mexico, you see the darker blue water, but up there in the beach area, that's the red tide. Again, these photos are all from the Tampa Bay Times. Another picture from, from that series showing the discolored water. And then here's uh, more of a, a little, uh, like the inter, intercoastal waterway area showing where the red tide has infiltrated in there. <clears throat> and again, these were all off of Pinellas County, not Tellsborough County. So uh, you saw this earlier in Stan's presentation. This is uh, our, our monitor, water quality monitoring network. Yeah, this is the one stations in Tampa Bay. We have 53 stations that are sampled on a monthly basis. And all of these stations are, are, are uh, sampled for red tide for Karenia brevis. So we're looking for bloom concentrations. We, we sample for all sorts of algae that are in the, in the water, but this is one of the ones we look for. And <clears throat> you're going to see, um, in the next few slides, you're gonna, we're going to be focusing on lower Tampa Bay, which is the blue dots in this picture. Uh, blue dots represent lower Tampa Bay. And then middle and Hillsborough Bay are in the green, and upper Tampa Bay is in the yellow. We typically see the uh, red tide in the lower Tampa Bay. Uh, before we get to those maps, so I want to focus on this. This comes from FWC, and this is what the concentrations of red tide and what the, the potential effects can be. So um, th the next few slides, you're going to see this color coding with, that's down at the bottom. So when red tide is not present, there are going to be gray dots, very low or white, low or yellow, medium counts are orange, and then high is red. So um, at the where there's, it's not present, no, we're not, obviously not uh, expecting any effects. But very low, uh, which is going to be the white dots, uh, there's, there's possible respiratory irritation, and shellfish harvesting closures begin at uh, greater than 500 cells per liter. So 
you can see the range for very low is 1,000 to 10,000 cells. So at, at half that point is when they, the FWC will prohibit shellfish harvesting. So even at very low conditions, there is already concerns. When you get to the yellow dots at low, you have respiratory, possible re respiratory irritation, possible fish kills, and then the actual the surface chlorophyll, which can be detected by satellites, can be seen, and that's an indicator of the red tide uh, exploding, getting bigger. At medium concentrations, now we're talking up to from 100,000 to, to a million cells per liter. You, respiratory irritation again, probable fish kills. Most likely we're gonna have fish kills. Um, and then once you get above the million cells per liter, you have all, all of the uh, previous conditions plus the water discolorization, and that's when you have the red tide. That is your actual bloom. But uh, these lower concentrations, we are, is found out there. So this is uh, EPC's sampling of Lower Tampa Bay. I'm gonna show you the, the past red tide, major red tide events we had over the past five years. This was 2018 and 2019. So you can see uh, in September, red tide is typically starts in late summer, early fall. It could persist throughout the winter. It's after the, after the rainy season when we have a you know, influx of nutrients is when it typically starts going on in our area. So September of 2018, you can see there's uh, a lot of gray dots, a couple, one of red out there by Egmont is moving in October. Uh, the, went from a high to a low at one of the stations, but we're still seeing more stations that are showing, showing uh, red tide conditions. November, we had a lot of uh, lower Tampa Bay showing uh, high, con high uh, concentrations. But then December, January, and February, they were all clear. So this, these, these things can come in and linger, persist, these conditions. Sometimes they can move out fairly quickly. It's just, it's all dependent on tides, weather, what's going on at that, you know, they're driven by wind, wind can push it out. If we have uh, storms come in, they can clear it out or push it into our area. Uh, this is 2021, uh, this was after post Piney Point, and the red tide uh, started earlier that year. So in May uh, 2021, we weren't seeing anything. June, it started getting hot in lower Tampa Bay. July, you know, for drought outside of the Skyway. August, we didn't see anything in our sampling. Uh, September, we had a little bit, and then by October, it was cleared out. So that was a, a shorter event. So this next slide is what we've been seeing currently of 2022 and 2023. So in October of 2022, we knew red tide was occurring in counties south of us down in Sarasota Bay, Charlotte Harbor. Uh, we weren't seeing it. We weren't seeing it in our results at that time. By November, started creeping up uh, outside the Lower Tampa Bay, outside the Skyway. December got a little hot there with with those stations that are in red. January it actually moved further up into the bay, but still Lower Tampa Bay, and but not the red spots. February we had the uh, just the one station out by Egmont showing. Uh, low concentrations, and then our March sampling, now we're seeing it again. So this is again a function of the tides and ocean currents and weather that's kind of sloshing it back and forth. We do not have, unfortunately, our April uh, data yet. We're, we're, we're doing April uh, next week for Lower Tampa Bay. Um, and it's another example of how quickly this th conditions can change. So this was beginning of uh, March, so this would be around the time that those pictures I showed earlier were from Pinellas County, the red tide. You can see all of the lower, or southwest Florida, all the way from Pasco County, all the way down to Collier, is orange and red, that, that's, you know, that's a lot of hot spots. This is actually FWC's sampling, and this comes from their website. So this is what they did for the week of March 2nd through March 9th. But one, yeah, oh, this one actually, uh, is actually statewide. So you can see the rest of the state here, and there's a lot of gray dots in the panhandle, east coast. It was only our area that was being affected. So one week later, now you can see a, you can see a change from the, the previous map like that. Still seeing it off the Pinellas County coast, but Sarasota Bay is cleared up with the gray dots. Gray is good. We're not having 
having issues. And then a little bit further south down in Lee and Collier still. Again, here statewide from that same time period, showing the same thing. It's just concentrated off of the shore of Pinellas County in Pasco. So this is our current conditions. This is from uh, last week. After we see updates, these maps on a weekly basis. So we don't have to, So this is 4, 6, April 6 through the 13th. So you can see conditions have improved dramatically. We still have a couple spots off of uh, Pinellas County that are that are get, getting hits. Again, Lower Tampa Bay, um, Manatee County is cleared up, and then Sarasota Bay is still having issues. And this was actually the statewide conditions then. So again, it's it's cleared up a lot in just one month. But you can see it can, it can change week to week. So here's the, this is a red tide forecast. So this is for this week and this comes from uh, the USF College of Marine Science and the Florida Wildlife Research Institute, part of FWC. So their red tide forecast, and again, this takes in to consideration weather, the tides, uh, circulation models, this is, this is all modeling, but they're forecasting very low conditions and just, you know, just at lower Tampa Bay, a little bit into Hillsborough County, there on the e eastern shore, and then down in, there's a little bit of yellow that are considered low down in uh, Sarasota Bay. But that's the forecast for this week. So in conclusion, uh, again, red tide is a natural occurrence phenomenon. Uh, these occurrences can be short in duration, others can be prolonged. Uh, red tide primarily starts in the, at the end of summer, uh, beginning of fall, and you know, in certain years it can persist throughout the winter, so it's more of a kind of a fall and winter issue when it's, when it's a problem like that, but it can cure any time of the year. Uh, the biggest thing is Hillsborough County is currently not experiencing any adverse effects from red tide. Uh, we have not received any red tide related fish kills in 2022, 2023 and we will remain vigilant and continue sampling for red tide at all base stations. And I wanna thank Commissioner Owen and Commissioner Wastel for coming out with us in the past and actually doing some of this sampling with us. They got to see it firsthand and uh, taking Commissioner Cameron Cepeda out again t uh, next week, I believe, to do that as well. So, and with that, I'm finished and I can answer any questions you may have. Thank Great. you. Great, any questions? No? Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and um, for uh, Commissioner Owen and, and Cohen, uh, Chris serves on the Agency on Bay Management and is very involved with the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. He took over for Tom Ash when Tom Ash retired. So if you have any questions. That was an excellent report. Thank he's you. your guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. That was a great report. Um, our next item is uh, 9D, which is the Petroleum Cleanup Program Expansion of Services presentation, which will be given by Andrea Murley. Good morning, Commissioners. Andrea Murley, EPC staff. I'm here this morning to provide an overview of why we are requesting three positions for EPC's Petroleum Cleanup Department. Our need is based on a substantial increase in workloads starting July 1st, 2023. The EPC's Petroleum Cleanup Department administers the Petroleum Restoration Program in Hillsborough County under a contract with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. The FDP provides full funding for this program, which protects groundwater resources critical in Florida, as over 95% of our drinking water comes from the groundwater. EPC site managers provide the technical oversight and administrative activities necessary to prioritize, assess, and clean up sites contaminated by discharges of petroleum products. Our site managers have diverse backgrounds in engineering, geology, and environmental science. Most petroleum contaminated sites have been determined eligible for state funded cleanup. Funding for the statewide petroleum restoration program is provided through the Inland Protection Trust Fund. The fund was established in 1986 and requires an excise tax on each barrel of petroleum produced or imported into the state. EPC received delegation to administer the program for Hillsborough County in 1987. 
State-funded sites are assigned a priority score, establishing their place in line for cleanup due to limited funding. The priority score is a number that represents the relative threat the discharge poses to potential receptors such as public or private drinking water wells. The higher the score, the greater the potential threat, with one being the least risk and 100 being the highest risk. We have 11 staff members in our group. Each site manager is responsible for the technical, fiscal, and administrative project management of 25 to 50 sites in different phases of cleanup. The current fiscal year contract is to actively manage 326 sites. In January 2023, FDEP lowered the priority score threshold to encompass all sites scored 10 or higher. The FDP appreciates the efficiency that EPC provides managing sites. Therefore, EPC's cleanup site managers will be expected to work on approximately 150 additional sites due to the score drop beginning July 1st, 2023, which is the start of the state's fiscal year. To continue to meet our contract obligations and provide the service to the public, an increase in staffing is required. Which brings me to our recommendation. We are asking for your authorization to move forward and ask the BOCC to establish three new positions for EPC's Petroleum Cleanup Department with no impacts to general funds. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the board? All right, so just to highlight, the, the three new staff is based off of whether or not we get the new contract. And that's why it's not an impact to the general funds, correct? Correct. And yeah. so we can have them ready and in the queue July 1st for that fiscal year and yeah. hire them so that the work can be done. But if the funding does not come down, the positions will not be filled. It's yeah. fully funded by the DEP. Perfect. Thank you. We do. Yeah. Just to move it forward. Are the tablets still? All right. All right. Take a vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Myers? Well, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Second. I move for approval of the three new positions. All right, I have a motion by Commissioner Myers and a second by Commissioner Cohen. Motion carried six to zero. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Appreciate it. So with that, commissioners, we're going to move to the executive director report. I have a, a few quick slides, and then um, our meeting will adjourn. Um, if James Brewer could bring my slides up, perfect. Uh, first slide, please. Next slide. Uh, last week, we held our spring in-service meeting. Um, that's where we bring all the employees together. Uh, it was on Thursday. And during uh, in-service, we recognized nine staff members for their years of service, ranging from five to 25 years. Um, our finance manager, Mike McKelvey, was recognized for a remarkable 35 years of service. Next slide, please. In conjunction with this impactful in-service meeting, we celebrated the dedication and renaming of EPC's Two North Conference Center. Former Waste Director Hushang Bustani served as our special guest speaker. Next slide, please. I'm proud to announce that the room is now officially named the Dr. Richard Garrity Conference Center in honor of Dr. Garrity's 15 years of dedicated service as the EPC Executive Director. We installed a special dedication plaque just above the main entrance. Next slide, please. The plaque reads, Dr. Richard Garrity Conference Center, dedicated to Richard Garrity, PhD, EPC Executive Director from 2000 to 2015, in recognition of a lifetime of outstanding service and commitment to EPC, staff, and the citizens of Hillsborough County. I would also like to give a special thanks to former EPC Chair and Commissioner Les Miller, who secured the funding for the renovation of the Two North Building while serving as our EPC Chair, which made this all possible. The Conference Center has been a tremendous asset as a meeting space, not only for our staff, but the county as well, and other county departments and partnering agencies. Next slide, please. 
Commissioner Wustel, our water staff, appreciated the opportunity to take you and your aides, Maria and Brian, out for sampling runs in Tampa Bay and to show you our water monitoring program in action firsthand. The water sample you collected was later analyzed by our laboratory for Karenia brevis, the red tide, which we just went through the presentation, and I'm glad to announce it was not present. Next slide, please. I attended several town hall meetings held by Commissioner Myers in March and April. These informative events are an excellent venue for me to meet personally with citizens and share about the important environmental service EPC provides and also take constituent complaint, you know, if they have complaints, take them right back to the agency for um, them to handle them. Next slide, please. General Counsel Rick Marotti and Attorney Beth Lee and I attended Legislative Day in Tallahassee and met with various legislative, legislators and aides, including Senator Jay Collins and Representative Florida, Florida Representative Lawrence McClure. Next slide, please. Senior staff have met with several new commissioner aides since March, including Glory Burgos, which is Commissioner Hagan's new aide, Davida Franklin, Commissioner Myers, new aide, and Cassandra Marion, Commissioner Owens, new aide. And I have to tell you, very engaged, energetic, bright people, and they ask a lot of great questions. Next slide, please. Staff also participated in the FDEP Southwest District Annual Open House. Well-attended events like this help EPC network with district staff, local industry, various professionals, and the general public. I wish to thank District Director Kelly Boatwright for the collaborative partnership and long-standing relationship fostered between our agencies. This is due in part to the state delegated programs EPC manages and the mutual goal we share to protect the natural resources of Hillsborough County. And I'd just like to say um, uh, Kelly will always be an EPCer. She was at EPC before she ascended into that role at DEP. Next slide, please. Betty Jo Tompkins with the Hillsborough Soil and Water Conservation District presented the Outstanding Cooperative Partner of the Year Award to me and the EPC staff at the Hillsborough 100 Luncheon. I was extremely surprised and very honored. Um, we were honored when we received this special award and it celebrates our partnership between our agencies and recognizes that we share a common mission of environmental stewardship. And if any of you have ever dealt with Betty Jo Tompkins, I wish I could bottle that energy. Oh my gosh, <laughs> she's amazing. Next slide, please. EPC participated in an annual Strawberry Festival luncheon and parade. We are pleased to support local community and agricultural events such as this one. Next slide, please. 2023 marks 54 years of Nature's Classroom. Their annual open house is a popular spring event for local families. Staff also volunteered to work at Camp Bayou Spring Nature Fest. The Turtle Kids Craft is a favorite activity for the children at these outreach events. Next slide, please. Hundreds of sixth through 12th grade students, finalists, display their scientific research at the Hillsborough County Regional and State STEM Fairs. Our volunteers are happy to serve as judges and encourage these aspiring student scientists. Additionally, EPC selects a local environmental merit award winner from one, for one student who presents an outstanding environmental STEM project. We will announce this year's winner during our June meeting. Um, next slide, please. It warms my heart to see how generous our staff is and to thank them for the support they demonstrate for philanthropic causes they choose to champion throughout the year. Staff collected money to create 72 Easter baskets for children enrolled at the Redlands Christian Migrant Association in Sefner. Staff additionally gave nearly $500 in cash donations and a bin full of food, toys, bedding, and supplies in support of the annual For the Love of Bustani Pet Resource Foundation fundraiser. The donations raised go to benefit homeless pets at the shelter and were presented to staff members Earl Brown, Matt Armetta and Kathy Ebner. Next slide, please. We are looking forward to holding our annual tree planting event at Bryan Elementary School on Arbor Day, which is April 28th. 
And I'm also excited to announce that our EPC Clean Air Fair is on May 4th at Poe Plaza downtown. It's right here during lunch. It's a great event. Music, free trees, free ice cream, all of these things. A lot of vendors, Publix, don't donate stuff. So we hope you can come out. This year, we'll be launching the 23 Hillsboro Solar Co-op during the fair which fittingly ties into this year's theme, invest your energy in a brighter future. And I'll tell you, that's our fifth solar co-op. I was part of the second solar co-op. Many of us have the solar energy, and I can tell you it's a great return on investment. But anyway, we invite the public to join us. It's free, and commissioners, we hope you can come. Next slide, please. And our next meeting will be May 18th, and that concludes uh, my presentation, uh, unless you have any questions. Did I forget to drop you, Commissioner Myers, or do you have a question? No. Okay. Commissioner Kim? I, I just put that on there for a future item. Okay. Commissioner Owen? I just want to thank you all. I, I noticed your engagement in the community, so uh, it's really great to see you, Janet, out there and staff. And I also noticed that you didn't let Commissioner Wostel handle the heavy equipment like I did when I went on the boat. I'm sure there's a reason for that. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, it was a great experience. And uh, just, again, I appreciate all your hard work. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. Future items? Yes. I just... Um I know Mr. Coleman came to the meeting this morning, and he had come here before, and his concern has been about the, um, the ash waste piles at uh, at the that are generated, I guess, by Tico and have historically been there. Correct. And he even brought up a new issue today about um, you know impacts if there was a hurricane. Um, but I just like the EPC, whatever it is, and I know that we talked. And uh, um, jurisdictionally, I guess it's, it's uh, EPA. DEP. DEP. DEP, thank you. Um, but if we can just maybe have report information or just have that brought back, let us know. It's the, you know, officially that it's a DEP. So we, that would be a good, okay. uh, I appreciate I that. I will do that. As he said, that consent order came out in 2001. There are many industries that had unlined ponds that used corrosion inhibitors and could have cadmium and arsenic or what, whatever the constituent is. Um, and then they do groundwater monitoring. And they all of those sites, most of those sites have all been cleaned up and relined. Um, I did talk to Kelly Boatwright, who is the head of FDP, and I'll read exactly what she told me. I'd be happy to give you before your briefings. Um, again, this is, this is an older consent order, but the department has an active consent order. Most of the coal ash has been removed from the site. However, the department is still monitoring the groundwater, which is very, very common. And my understanding is that TECO met most, if not all, the criteria ahead of the timeline. Uh, there is currently a revised groundwater monitoring plan in-house that staff is reviewing. And my guess would be because the constituents change or the plume changes or whatever. So I will get the most recent information and bring it to you individuals. But um, uh, it is with it does rest with the uh, Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Thank you. I just I just think it's good for us to publicly report on that. OK, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. I have a future item, and I'm really just going to open up the floor to the board here. Would you like me to work with staff to make sure that future EPC meetings don't land when we have 6 p.m. planning and hearing meetings? If you're fine with it, it's fine. I just was thinking about it this morning. Anything you want to do is fine. Okay, I'll, and we'll get input from Commissioner Hagan later, and then we'll get together. Right, yeah. Okay. It, it came, we used to always be the third Thursday of every of every month for over 50 years. And then during Mike Mer Merrill's tenure, he didn't like how BOCC meetings and EPC meetings were co-located. So Lou Ann comes out with a, a calendar a year in advance. That's why some are so close together, two weeks, then six weeks. And so whatever, and we do, would like, I'd like to include Bonnie Weiss or administration in that too. Um, in those conversations, if that's yeah. okay, Chairman. Yeah, just yeah. whatever. Okay. Whatever makes it easier. I know our schedules are complicated, but if there's a way to avoid the potential 12-hour day for all of the commissioners, then I'd be happy to work on it. You know, Absolutely. just a comment. I think that the problem may be actually be the evening when the, the evening exactly. hearings are scheduled. <laughs> it, it may be that the planning commission is who you want to involve because mm -hmm. I think I think we're having too many of them, right. and uh, 
I, that is the issue that perhaps would be better to open up. The Thursdays here are fine. I think maybe that is the road. I share that same yeah. sense. Okay, we'll, we'll, um, we'll follow up on that then. Yes. All right, then thank you very much. If there's no other questions, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.